Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining our webinar this morning on the topic of uh, spaces about electrical equipment. Uh, this topic is primarily about NFPA 70, which is NEC, National Electric Code, and this focus on Article 110.26 and 110.34. So we have a guest speaker today, Charlie Miller. Uh, a quick introduction about Charlie. Charlie is a electrical safety expert, um, expert in writing books, and he has done a lot of uh, uh, published articles and also several books on electrical installation, which is uh, NEC guide. And also he sits in NFPA 70E technical committee. Uh, so uh, he is here with us today and uh, he's going to talk about this uh, spaces about electrical equipment and uh, how to uh, interpret the code within these articles. So without any further delay, I will uh, turn it over to Charlie. So Charlie, it's all yours. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Bono. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our objectives today will be we're going to talk about the working space requirements for equipment operating in a thousand volts nominal or less to ground, and that is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. Uh, we're, we're starting with 110.26 in the National Electrical Code. It's going to be the 2020 edition. The, we're going to recall working space provisions pertaining to entrances, uh, entrances to and exits from working spaces. We're going to identify conditions that require personnel doors to be equipped with listed panic hardware or a new change in the 2020 edition. They, they also now call it listed fire exit hardware, but I'll show you that in a little bit. We're going to summarize the dedicated space above and below panel boards, switchboard, switchgear, and motor control centers. All right, so where is this located? It's in part two of Article 110. The, it, it starts with 110.26, which uh, this is going to be an hour presentation today, and we've got, I've got lots of slides built in. And even at that, it, it's, there's still some more information in 110.26. There's a lot of information there. We're also going to cover or look at uh, real briefly what are the spacing requirements for over 1,000 volts, and, and we'll, that'll be in 110.34. All right, so in, it starts out in 110.26, access and working space shall be, shall be provided and maintained about all electrical equipment to permit ready and safe operation and maintenance of such equipment. So the question is, what equipment, what electrical equipment requires working space? Well, in the beginning right here, it says it, all electrical equipment requires working space. Well, now this is a very general rule but we don't have any specific distances with this general rule. But just remember if once we're getting into specific equipment, it, we will have very specific distance requirements. But if the equipment doesn't come under that, um, that's that, uh, likely to require examination, adjustment or servicing while energized, then it it, it does still have to have working space as stated in the very first sentence here. All right, so in 110.26a, and you'll notice on the slide, the bottom left corner gives the, the section in the National Electrical Code. So this says working space for equipment operating at 1,000 volts nominal or less to ground, and here's the key part, likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized have to comply with the dimensions in 110.26 A1, A2, A3, and A4. A4 was added just uh, an addition, uh, I think in the last edition or the one before. And so we have, now notice it says a thousand votes nominal or less. Now this was a change, not in this edition, but the the last, uh, the 2017 or 2014, um, there was was a uh, there have been a lot of sections and and places in the National Electrical Code where the voltage threshold was changed from 600 volts to 1,000 volts, 
and it used to say uh, operating at 600 volts or less. Now it says 1,000 volts or less, And but it, it, this wasn't a change in this edition. The depth of working space, 110.26A1. And also the depth is going to be for, for over 1,000 volts is going to be found in 110.34A. Clear working space is required for equipment. And again, the key part is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. We measure the distance from the exposed live parts or from the enclosure or the opening if the live parts are, are enclosed. Uh, so it, it, a panel board would be from the, because it says, uh, or from the enclosure opening if the live parts are are enclosed. Now I've got some illustrations showing this as well in, in a little bit. Working space for voltages greater than 1,000 volts are in table 110.34a, and I will show that uh, near the end of this uh, presentation. I'll show the, the table. Let's look at the table for 1,000 volts nominal or less. Uh, this one is, uh, we have the three rows. Uh, zero to 150 volts to ground, uh, 151 to 600, and 601 to 1,000. In the last edition, it was changed. It used to only go up to 600 volts, but when they changed it uh, to one, up to 1, 600 to 1,000, another row was added in. The minimum clear distances are given in three conditions. You'll notice anywhere from three feet up to five feet. And we have three conditions. Well, what are the conditions? The conditions are shown directly below the table in the National Electrical Code. What's condition one? Exposed live parts on one side of the working space and there are no live or no grounded parts on the other side of the working space or exposed live parts on both sides of the working space if they're effectively guarded by insulating material. All right, let's look at an illustration for this. Uh, I, as Bono uh, stated, uh, I write electrical books. I used to write magazine articles. Uh, I wrote an article in Electrical Contractor Magazine for 19 years called The Code and Focus. I also do my own illustrations. So these, uh, all the illustrations in this presentation are ones that I have drawn. All right, so we have uh, the equipment uh, for condition one, meaning you've got the electrical equipment and on the other side from that is a non-grounded surface, then the distance has to be at least three feet. Condition two and three. Condition two is exposed live parts on one side of the working space and grounded parts on the other side of the working space. And well, what about something like concrete or a concrete block? Well, in the next sentence in that, in that condition, it tells us concrete brick or tile walls are considered grounded. Uh, th that helps a lot in understanding. Okay, I don't know if that if that uh, if that concrete block wall or brick or block wall is grounded or not. Well, it tells us right here that it shall be considered grounded. Condition three is exposed live parts on both sides of the working space. All right. So condition two. But before we look at the illustration for that. In all the conditions, zero through 150 is only three feet. So if the equipment face to ground is only, uh, is a one, it, it may be a 120 volt piece of equipment, then, uh, then we've got the, the, for all three conditions, one, two, and three, it would, it's only three feet. All right, so 151 to 600 volts for condition two, if you have a grounded surface on the other side, and and maybe you've got a, uh, some electrical equipment on the other side of that, um, and or maybe the back of a motor control center, uh, where it's not open, where it it doesn't open from the back side, 
then it, that would be a grounded surface. Your minimum distance for 151 to 600 is three and a half feet. The um, 1601 to 1,000 volts, it jumps it up. You've got to have a minimum distance of four feet. Our condition three, 151 to 600 volts yeah, with live parts on both sides of the working space, you have to have uh, four feet of clearance from the outside edge of the equipment. Uh, for 601 to 1,000 volts, it jumps up to five feet. Working space has to be maintained even after installation. Uh, there was uh, a couple of code cycles back. Uh, I believe somebody, someone had suggested that um, the distance uh, would have to be labeled onto the panel board, uh, onto the electrical equipment, what the clear working space different distance is uh, beside and out from the piece of electrical equipment. And it did not get accepted. Uh, and, and when I saw that, I'm thinking, all right, really, do we need more markings, more information on a piece of electrical equipment? And it's it, there's a lot of information right now that's required. Um, years ago, a friend of mine told me that in, in the plant he used to work in, and this was it was years ago, the uh, the electricians had a great idea or someone, uh, supervisors or management or somebody had a great idea to block off an area uh, mark, painted out on the floor, just like it is in this one. They, this, this is not from the one, uh, the plant he worked for, but uh, they, they marked it out on the floor and they told everybody that if you put anything in that area that's marked off, the electricians will throw it away. Be careful about doing something like this because he said it backfired on them. It, it, some, some of the other maintenance or some of the other people that worked there realized, oh wait, I've got a, a 55 gallon drum of trash and, and I've got it, I would have to take it 300 feet away to dump it or 20 feet away, I could put it in that spacing that's in front of the electrical panel, and they told me the electricians will throw it away. So uh, be, be careful about something like that. But having it marked off is not a bad idea. Uh, it's not required. Uh, dead front assemblies, working space is not required for the back or sides of assemblies where all connections and, re are, uh, and all renewable uh, or adjustable parts are accessible from locations other than the sides or back. And, and so if you've probably seen electrical rooms that have back-to-back uh, -back motor control centers or MCCs, and that's just fine because there's, uh, there's no accessible parts from the back of those. Uh, dead front assemblies include, but they're not limited to, dead front switchboards, switch gear, and motor control centers. All right, I mentioned a while ago that I do my own illustrations. Uh, this is an illustration. You've probably heard of, of Square D. Well, this is Square M. This is the, the Miller brand. And this is the, this is the Cadillac uh, of equipment here. So uh, years ago, and, and when I first wrote uh, the, the first book uh, that got published, uh, Illustrated Guide to the National Electrical Code, and I was doing my own illustrations, I thought, I'm gonna put my own brand name on, on, on my illustrations. All right, now the width of the working space has to be the width of the equipment or 30 inches, whichever is greater. All right, this is a, this is a, a square D uh, piece of equipment. It is wider than 30 inches, therefore the width of the working space in front of this equipment has to be at least the width of the equipment. All right, so the it, it doesn't have to be centered. So we have a panel board, and um, the it, it doesn't have to be like in the center illustration where the panel board's right. You've got basically from the very center uh, of the piece of equipment, you've got 30, 15 inches on one side, 15 on the other. 
Well, it doesn't have to be. The, the spacing could start right at the edge of the this panel board and go to the left. It could be centered. It could start uh, at the right and go to the left. Also, it, spacing can overlap. And in this case, uh, they, can, they can share the spacing. So they don't have to have their own uh, 30 inches of working space, each piece of equipment. Uh, for example, the panel board on the left starts on the left and goes over 30 inches and goes into the spacing of the panel board on the right. Also, the panel board on the right starts, the spacing starts on the right of it and goes to the left. So the, the overlapping space for each of them is, is that orange uh, area right in the middle, but that, that's okay. Years ago, this, this section was added to the code, which is great. In all cases, the workspace shall permit at least a 90 degree opening of equipment doors or hinged panels. I have been, I mean, I've been an electrician a long time. I went through the apprenticeship program. Uh, I had my own electrical uh, contracting company in, in Nashville, Tennessee for about 18 years. Most of what I did was commercial and industrial. I have seen a lot of panel boards in industrial applications. Maybe it was an old panel board and they put another panel board or piece of equipment beside it and the and what happened is it blocked the door from being opened all the way. And it was very difficult to work on. So, uh, I, I, I mean, this, this code has been, this requirement's been in the code for quite a while. Height of the working space. The workspace shall be clear and extend from the grade floor or platform to a height of six and a half feet or the height of the equipment, whichever is greater. All right, so in this case, the panel board is not six and a half feet, but the, the, the working space has to extend to six and a half feet since it's not above that. Years ago, uh, for residential, the working space for a uh, panel board for residential was six and a quarter feet, uh, six feet, three inches. Uh, it, it has been changed for a long time. Uh, all the working space is is six and a half feet, even residential. Uh, there's an there is an exception though for existing dwelling units. Within the height requirement of 110.26a3, other equipment. Now here's a, an addition, a change to the 2020 edition other equipment or support structures such as concrete pads that are associated with the electrical installation and, and located above or below the electrical equipment shall be permitted to extend not more than six inches beyond the front of the electrical equipment. All right, so it, what, and, and you can see I noted the change uh, by bold red letters and also the 2020 icon over on the left. Well, what does this mean? All right, so we have a piece of equipment. We have a wireway. It says associated equipment located above or below the electrical equipment cannot, shall not extend more than six inches beyond the front of the electrical equipment. All right, so we've got a, a, a wireway below this panel board that is 12 inches, 12 by 12. The panel board above that is six inches. Well, what if our pan, our wireway below it was 14? Well, that's okay, but we would have to put Unistrut or something uh, enough behind that panel board where the difference uh, between the wireway and the panel board, is, the front of the panel board is no more than six inches. So just, and, and that's been, uh, most all of these, have been rules in place for a long time, except for this one. This one was a change in the 2017 edition. In, in 2017, a new provision for limited access was added to 110.26a, and it addresses equipment located in a space with limited access, such as uh, above a suspended ceiling or in a crawl space. 
before that, there was a, a section uh, before the 2017, uh, there, there was a section that just applied to resistance heating element type duct heaters. Now this applies to uh, more than everything, uh, not just enclosures for resistance uh, heating element type duct heaters. And so there, there's a lot of information in this. We don't have time to cover all of this. I at least wanted to to let you know about this. If you if you're not if you haven't seen this in the 2017 edition, this applies to equipment above lay-in ceilings and in crawl spaces. The it has to have certain size openings, and and there's just a, a number of provisions there that. Uh, you need to make sure you're you're complying with all of that. Clear spaces, required working space shall not be used for storage. Uh, this is a retail store on the square in Oxford, Mississippi. And as you can see, there's uh, there's all kinds of clothing and shoes and everything in front of the access to this panel board. Um, about a week and a, almost a week and a half ago, uh, we were in Oxford in the same store. Uh, I didn't get a, a, take a picture of it, but now there is so much stuff in front of that panel board. I know the panel board's there. Nobody else, probably including employees, would even know it's there because it is covered up so much. All right, let's talk about entrances and exits. Well, a, a while back, the uh, it used to just talk about entrances uh, for forever. It just talked about entrances to uh, rooms that that contained electrical equipment. Th then they made a change in it. Well, right now it says at least one entrance of sufficient area has to be uh, provided giving access to egress and from electrical equipment's workspace. All right, so this is a main general rule it says, all right, if you have um, electrical equipment in a room, you have to have an entrance. It does not give any particular sizing. And uh, there was one I, I used to teach uh, for NPA on their seminar circuit, and 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 uh, there was a hotel in in um, Pittsburgh that I went into that evidently it used to be uh, an apartment complex or condominium and it, it turned into a hotel and I noticed there was a big room that was uh, not part of the room it was in the room where I was but it was it was blocked off it was walled off and I noticed there was a uh, access door maybe a foot and a half by foot and a half or or foot and a half by two feet uh, down low and and it had a, a vented area above it and I looked I may have stood on a chair I don't remember that I'm sure I stood on the uh, the legal uh, re legally required ladder um, so I looked in that vent and saw a panel board but that used to be a kitchen well and, okay so there's a panel board in there but it doesn't it it was not large equipment which we're going to look at next and this section says it has to have at least one entrance which it did and it has to be a sufficient area well it was but it was was an access hole which was fine it was permitted now once we get into large equipment and there was a little bit of change in the uh, 2020 edition uh, the the main the first part of it didn't change, but they they added a, a section at uh, the number two part that wasn't there before. Well, for large equipment that contains overcurrent devices, switching devices, or control devices, there shall be at least one entrance to or egress from uh, from the required working space of not less than 24 inches wide and six and a half feet high at each end of the working space. All right, so now this is talking about large equipment, which uh, on the next slide you'll see what what constitutes large equipment. But this gives us minimum openings for large equipment. And also this is what they used to, 
years ago, several editions back, it used to say we had to have one entrance. Well, then I guess someone said, well, okay, you've got an entrance. Well, what about an exit? So uh, codes were proposed and accepted uh, for the wording change. So, so now it says, uh, it talks about an entrance to and egress from. All right, so, but the, the minimum sizing for this opening is at least two feet wide and six and a half feet high. Now, this requirement, what was changed, what was added, the bold red here, this requirement shall apply, shall apply to either of the following conditions. It, it used to just say the, that large equipment was rated 1,200 amps or more and over six feet wide. Well, now that, that has become number one. Number two now also, this, this is a new addition that, wasn't, that hasn't been in the NEC. Number two says for service disconnecting means installed in accordance with 230.71, where the combined ampere rating is 1200 amps or more and over six feet wide. Well, 230.71 is the, a lot of people call it the six disconnect rule, where you, you're allowed up to six disconnecting means uh, that without a main overcurrent device. So uh, without a main fuse or breaker. Now, be careful. There was uh, there have been some big changes in residential where that's no longer allowed. Uh, we used to be able to do that in residential uh, up to, uh, for uh, six uh, six disconnect rule, but that's no longer allowed. Uh, so, uh, also open equipment doors shall not impede the entry to or egress from the working space. Sometimes code rules are are like. Duh, I mean, that, that makes sense, but a lot of times they have to be put into the code book and, and sometimes it's because of some things that have happened. All right, so what does this really say? Let, let's go, let me go back a slide. Uh, for large equipment that contain overcurrent devices, switching device or control devices, there has to be one entrance to or and egress from the required working space at each end of the working space. All right, so here's the illustration. I've got switch gear, 277, 480 volt, three phase switch gear. It is 1200 amperes. It is over, the equipment is over six feet wide. So therefore, uh, the uh, we have to have a entrance to and, and egress from at each end of the working space. Well, the, the working space, because this is 277 volts to ground and we have a grounded surface directly across from it, we have to have a working space of three and a half feet. Uh, remember that because that we're going to need to, we're going to look at this uh, part of the same drawing again. So just remember the 277 volt grounded surface on the other side, three and a half feet. All right, so this is our general, main general rule that says you have to have a, an entrances in, or exits at each end of this working space for large equipment. A single entrance to and egress from the required working space is permitted where the location permits a continuous and an unobstructed way of egress travel. All right, so in this case, uh, we still have the same switch gear. And now we have one entrance to and egress from because from anywhere on the front of that, which is which was is the accessible areas of that, then you can turn and run unobstructed. If the work now we have another option that we can go by. If the workspace specified by 110.26A1 is doubled and the edge of the entrance nearest the equipment meets the minimum clear distance in table 110.26A1, one entrance to the working space is acceptable. All right, so what does this mean? Uh, just a minute or two ago, I said, remember that 277 480 volt switch gear, the working space, what is that? The minimum working space required is three and a half feet. Well, if we double that, 
and if the equipment is at least that working space dimension, just a single working space dimension, not doubled, but if it's three and a half feet from the entrance, now we can have just one entrance. Now before, when we had a, a, a entrance to an egress from on either end of that, there was there is no requirement to be a certain distance from the door opening. But if we're going to use the one door rule, then then we have to have be at least three and a half feet from the opening uh, from the door to the equipment. Personnel doors were equipment rated 800 amperes or more that contain devices such as overcurrent switching or control. They're installed in is installed and there's a personnel door or doors intended for entrance to and egress from the working space less than 25 feet from the nearest edge of the working space the door shall open in the direction of egress and be be equipped with listed panic hardware or what they now added to the 2020 edition or listed fire exit hardware before the 2014 edition it was 1200 amps, not 800. In the 2014 edition, it dropped from 1200 amps down to 800 amps uh, as far as having to have this door. And now it's, you remember, let's go back and look at that. It, it's within 25 feet of the nearest edge of the working space. So there may be more than one door that, that it would be having to go out and it would it would come under this uh, required provision of having to have the uh, listed panic hardware or listed fire exit hardware. Also in the 2014 or before the 2014 edition, it used to say, it had a lot more wording in there. It used to say panic bars, pressure plates or other devices that are normally latched but open under simple pressure. That was it, it was changed to just simply listed panic hardware, which was a great idea. Dedicated equipment space. All right, now we're we're going in before we had working space. And what was the working space required for? Well, it was required for electrical equipment that required examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. That would, and, and that had very specific dimensions for minimum working space clearances. Now we, we look at 110.26E, this is for dedicated equipment space. Well, what is dedicated? All right, I'm glad you asked. Uh, all switch boards, switch gear, panel boards, and motor control centers shall be located in dedicate, dedicated spaces and protected from damage. It, it is a very specific group of equipment. Switch boards, switch gear, panel boards, and motor control centers. It used to say distribution boards. For a long time it said that, but nobody knew what a distribution board was. There was no definition in the NEC, and there was uh, some uh, document that had that in the name, but there was nothing in the in the uh, in the NFPA document that that defined it. So it, it, it's very specific: switchboard, switchgear, panel boards, and motor control centers, where subject to physical damage, equipment must be protected. Uh, dedicated equipment space is subdivided into indoor space and outdoor locations. Indoor and outdoor locations. We haven't always had provisions for outdoor dedicated equipment space. That was just in the last couple of editions that that was added. Well, let's talk about indoor first. Well, the what is talking about dedicated equipment space? It's, it's sort of like the panel board's footprint. It is a space equal to the equipment's width and depth, beginning at floor level and extending to a height of six feet above the equipment or to the structural ceiling, whichever is lower, 
and that is dedicated for our electrical installation. And you see I have a panel board. There is dedicated space above and below it that is the equipment's width and depth, or what we may call the equipment's uh, the footprint. Now, not, uh, not everything is, is in that listing of it, it is it's just certain equipment the space equal to the equipment's width and depth is commonly referred to as equipment's footprint and let's let's go back let me make sure you understand what equipment is required to meet this dedicated equipment space right at the top there switchboards switch gear panel boards and motor control centers all right so the disconnect switch on the left side does not it, dedicated space for it is not required. The transformer dedicated space for it is not required. Could you have dedicated space there? Sure, but it is not required. And typically, the reason why it wouldn't be required for a disconnect switch, once you install a disconnect switch, you're not going to be coming in adding additional uh, conduits, uh, raceways, and, and tying on circuits into a, a regular disconnect or safety switch, where panel boards, switch boards, switch gear, motor control centers, yes, you're liable to come in later and, and add circuits uh, that, that weren't there before. And you need to be, we need to be able to get to those, uh, those types of equipment to be able to add to them later on. So that's why we have dedicated space there. Now we can put anything we want to in that dedicated space, but others can't. Well, what do you mean? All right, foreign systems. And, and there, there's more, there's explanation under that uh, 110.26E1A. Uh, systems foreign to the electrical installations are not permitted below the electrical equipment. Systems foreign to the electrical installations are not permitted above in cases where the structural ceiling is within six feet of, of the top of the equipment. All right, let's look at an illustration. We have a, a side view of a panel board, plumbing pipe or gas pipe or uh, water line, drain line. Systems foreign to our electrical system are not permitted in the dedicated space below the the panel board. All right, so if if you've got a if it doesn't go into the panel board's footprint, then that's fine. And again, you you, you got to go back to remember we we have to have working space. We have to have at least 30 inches or the width of the equipment, whichever is greater. And if we can go, maybe the plumbing pipe is, is at the bottom out of that dedicated space, but kind of beside the, where the panel board line comes down, as long as we have dedicated working space to the, to the other side of that, it would be fine. So in this case, plumbing pipe above it and a drip pan, it, it doesn't, both of those are, are foreign systems, they would not be allowed. So if our structural ceiling was above that, then as long as we can go up six, six feet, then, then any other foreign systems could be added. But be careful, we're, 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 we're gonna have to protect that uh, piece of electrical equipment, for example. And so maybe put a drip pan, but uh, even if the plumbing pipe is, is above that, the drip pan cannot go in that dedicated space either. It would have to be above that. All right, outdoor installation requirements. Installation requirements uh, for outdoors uh, shall be the following. Installed in identified enclosures, protected from accidental contact by unauthorized persons or by vehicular traffic, protected from accidental spillage or leakage, uh, from piping systems. This is all in uh, 110.26E2A. We've had this requirement for a long time. Uh, this says outdoor electrical equipment must comply with the working space clearances specified in 110.26A. 
meaning that, okay, we've got to have at least 30 inches width or the width of the equipment. We have electrical equipment there that is likely to require examination, adjustment, surfacing, or maintenance while energized, right? The panel board. And so our, our, our height has to be at least six and a half feet or the height of the equipment. So this has been in the code for a long time. And it's also said no architectural apparatuses or other equipment should be located in that zone. Now, this hasn't been in this section all that long, just a couple of additions. This is the dedicated equipment space for outdoors. Uh, and again, it was just added a couple of additions back. And, and I talk about the additions of the code the National Electrical Code, although it always hasn't been on this same uh, code cycle, the, the, the time frame, uh, it is now the National Electrical Code and NFPA 70 is on a three-year revision cycle. Uh, the, newest, uh, the newest National Electrical Code is the 2020 edition. The newest uh, NFPA 70E Electrical Safety in the Workplace is the 2021 edition. All right, so the outdoor dedicated equipment space. It's the space equal to, it's the same as what we had before. The space equal to the width and depth of the equipment and extending from grade to a height of six feet above the equipment shall be dedicated to the electrical installation. No piping or other equipment formed to the electrical installation shall be located in this zone. All right, so with an illustration here. The the part of the illustration to the left, we have a, a panel board, an outdoor panel board. And so a panel board is one of the four types of equipment listed. Meter base is not. So therefore, the dedicated space is above and below the panel board. We do not have to have the dedicated space above the meter base. It is the space equal to the width and depth of the equipment and it extends from grade to a height of six feet above the equipment. So uh, uh, our uh, gutter is, is over six feet, that's fine. And, but on the one on the right, the downspout comes across for whatever reason, it comes across, therefore it's in the dedicated space and therefore it is a violation. So it more than likely, uh, to fix that, the electrician is going to take out their sawzall. <clears throat> They're going to cut in a slot, take out that section of, of, of uh, uh, the, the down pipe, and take a section of it out, and that way they, they will have a clear um, uh, above and below. Plus, it'll it'll shoot water right on top of that. No, no, that that's just uh, it shouldn't. This shouldn't be done uh, at all to begin with. Now, not that long ago, it, it there was no provisions uh, specific for dedicated outdoor space. Uh, the provision was there for working space in front of and above it, but not uh, or in front of up to a certain height but not above it and below it like we have now for dedicated space. There's an exception. The structural overhang or, or overhangs or roof extensions shall be permitted in the outdoor uh, dedicated equipment space. All right, so in this case, we um, above the panel board, it only goes up to four feet. And at that point, we have a roof extension or overhang uh, soffit maybe, and that is that is permitted. <clears throat> Locked room or enclosures, electrical equipment or rooms, uh, electrical equipment rooms or enclosures housing electrical apparatuses uh, that are controlled by lock or locks are considered accessible to qualified persons. Uh, there was a, a change in the last, not in this edition, but the, the 2017 and 2014, there were some changes about um, accessible to qualified persons. And it, it was uh, talking about if, if a qualified person has a key uh, to a, a closed electrical room or a locked up electrical box, 
then that key is that qualified person would be considered accessible. And, and this also had been saying the same thing that um, the, uh, the electrical equipment, if it's controlled by locks, it is considered accessible to, of course, to qualified persons. Circuits over a thousand volts. Uh, part three in Article 110 contain requirements for conductors and equipment that's used on circuits over a thousand volts. A requirement, and, and where this started coming from uh, years ago was there are some, evidently, some uh, large photovoltaic systems, uh, PV systems uh, that are, uh, from what I've heard, uh, has a voltage of six, nine, 690 volts. I know a lot of industrial plants have different voltages in. Uh, a, a lot of them, or most that uh, most uh, electricians and maybe engineers know about, uh, typically the highest may be 480 volts, but there are other systems out there that are uh, a lot of systems, 600 volts and less. But the uh, photovoltaic system of 690 volt is above that 600 voltage threshold. And evidently it wasn't much to change equipment that had a 600 volt rating up to a thousand volt rating, because otherwise, uh, those types of systems, because it was above 600 volt, had to be you had to use uh, medium voltage equipment instead of uh, just our regular 600 volt and below equipment. So now this is th that's why it, it was changed from, and it, 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 it a lot of places now in the code book it ramped it up from 600 to 1,000, uh, but I still don't think it's been everywhere yet. Part three in Article 110 contains requirements for conductors and equipment used on circuits over a thousand volts. The requirements for workspace equipment, they're found in 110.32. Entrances to and exits from enclosures and access to working space provisions, they can be found in 110.33. And a lot of these are very similar to what we just looked at for a thousand volts and below. Equipment likely to require, you've heard this before, if it's likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized, it has to meet the working space requirements in 110.34a. All right, so this table is just like the, the table we looked at earlier for 1,000 volts or less, except this one is over 1,000 volts. We have three conditions. They're like the conditions we looked at before. And this has uh, nominal voltage to ground. It goes up to, well, it goes over 75,000 uh, volts, uh, 1,000 uh, and 1 to 2,500 volts. And then it goes up to 9,000, then 25,000, uh, from 25,000 and 1 volt up to 75,000 volts and then above. And so we have all the different conditions there if you're working with this type of equipment and you need to know these, uh, these specific uh, dimensions. All right, so what have we covered in very quickly? Uh, I, I know we covered it very quickly, uh, but I, I wanted to um, make sure at least you, you will have this information. And you may have a question out there I haven't looked yet uh, about will you uh, be able to have access uh, to this uh, information. Uh, I will, I haven't given uh, Banu, I haven't given Grace uh, the PDF of the presentation, but I will. So you will have access to the PDF, uh, but not the actual PowerPoint program. So what have we learned? Access and working space is required for all electrical equipment. And now that was the first thing that we looked at. All electrical equipment has to have access and working space. Then we got into more specific requirements for equipment that is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. Well, what about something like a transformer? Well, I could argue both ways on a transformer. 
I could say, well, no, I'm never get, going to get into the transformer uh, for uh, adjustment or servicing or maintenance while it's energized. I can do voltage testing on the uh, safety switch or the panel board or the piece of equipment that it supplies, and, and then if I, I can de-energize it and go through the steps to put the equipment into an electrically safe work condition, and I can work on it uh, without it being energized in any of those cases. Would I rather see working space in front of a, a transformer? Yes, absolutely. Included in the specific working space requirements are provisions that pertain to depth, width, width, and height the working space, as well as a fairly new requirements for limited access uh, requirements for above a uh, uh, ceiling tiles and below, uh, it, under a house or, un, or in an access below. One entrance of sufficient area must be provided giving access to and egress from electrical equipment. It's working space, unless the equipment is classified as large equipment, then we have more specific rules and, and we have some alternative rules for that as well. Uh, dedicated equipment space is required for switchboard, switchgear, panel boards, and motor control centers. All right, here's my contact information. If, if we don't get, I know we're running out of time to try to answer uh, all the questions. Uh, I always want you to have my contact information that you can, you can send me an email. Uh, when you do send me an email, though, if, if you send an email, uh, make sure you put your phone number uh, on the email because a lot of times it's easy for me just to go ahead and call you rather than go back and forth with questions and questions and questions to try to figure out exactly this or that. And a lot of times it's just uh, I, I'm at my when I'm not out teaching, uh, I'm at my computer a lot, so sometimes it's just a lot easier and nicer for me to step away from my computer and to um, uh, to have a phone call. All right, Banu, I guess we can look at, uh, got a number of questions, don't we? Yep. So you were able to see the questions, right, Charlie? Uh, yes, I can this time. I had, had trouble last time, but we, we're, we're over that now. Uh, I'm uh, sure it's available. Uh, I don't, think, I don't um, think you can go through all of them, just pick the top three or four as the time permits, and then uh, we can do a response to the... Apply only within buildings, or are they for, they're, they're for electrical equipment, and that may have been before I uh, got into outdoor equipment. Uh, let's see, the question is talking about, can you place a disconnect under a platform or access panel? You've got to have a working space. And it's gonna come back to, for disconnect, is it, uh, are you going to have to have, a, is it going to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized? Then you've got to have that height of working space. There's a question about lockout, tag out, not really getting into that with this um, National Electrical Code. That's more of a, a 70E requirement, although that you're talking about one that's out outside of the U.S., See that in this other one, minimum space above electrical panels. I think I covered that within the dedicated equipment space. Don't really have time to cover the six disconnect rule. Um, I, I know you said if time is available. Uh, if you want to talk about that, uh, send me an email, uh, put your phone number down. I'll, I'll give you a call on that. No, some of these came up before I covered these. Um, so, uh, Charlie, one thing is, uh, Sunny asked one thing. So for shared spaces, is there a requirement to work only in panel one at a time? Can you? Uh, no, there is no mention of that in the National Electrical Code. Okay. Uh, that, that That's a great question uh, yep. because um, if, that would be more of a risk assessment would have to be done, and that would really more come under uh, NFPA 70E for uh, working in equipment, but nothing is in the National Electrical Code uh, okay. concerning that. Do you have uh, another one, Banu, that uh, should try to hit? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, 
So can you see that the dedicated space requirements apply to control panels too? I think so. Electrical equipment, control panels fall under. Well, not dedicated. Uh, dedicated is uh, panel boards, switchboards, switch gears, and motor switch gear motor control center. So an industrial control panel would have to have working space, yep. but not dedicated space. So it has to have the space, the width well, of it. And most uh, industrial control panels are going to be wider than 30 inches, or a lot of them. And it's going to have to have the height requirement and in the the spacing in front of it. But as far as the dedicated space above and below it, that's only for four specific uh, types of equipment. Okay, now that's good. So it's more like uh, performing the maintenance tasks around that industrial control panel. Someone need to have space to do the work around it safely. Yes. Access things. Okay. I think. Uh, Pretty much, I think most of the questions are regarding the lockout tagout, which is a completely different topic by itself. I think we can talk about it for probably a few hours at least. Hey, uh, before uh, we conclude, I want to just quickly uh, remind you guys, I'm going to show my camera here. Uh, so this is uh, Charlie's book, Illustrated Guide to National Electric Code. It's available on Amazon. And uh, this one shows a lot of details, which Charlie talked about with all the illustrations and uh, with the detail explanation and how to interpret the code. I know that this code gets really difficult when uh, you try to read it through and just understand it purely on the text basis. So please feel free to uh, go ahead and uh, get yourself a copy and uh, read through that. And if you need more uh, help, please do reach out to Charlie and uh, he'll be really glad to help you guys out, okay? Uh, anything else, Charlie, you'd like to add? Uh, just if, if, if this is someone's first time joining in, uh, check out Grace uh, Technologies. Uh, there, they they do they have a tremendous number of, of webinars that are that have been recorded and that are accessible. And uh, the some of the great ones like mine. There are a lot of other great ones as well. Uh, Terry Becker, Banu, uh, many other uh, great webinars they have provided for free, which is incredible. And so just check out check out their um, YouTube channel and and uh, look for them online to, for their training. And uh, it, it covers a lot of different items. Uh, they, they have me helping with National Electrical Code and NFPA 70E. And they have others that are that, that do some of the same things. And so it's just the, the price is great for free. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ali. I mean, again, if you guys have any uh, general questions about safety or even the code interpretation, please feel free to send an email to me or Charlie or whoever you can find and we'll be more than happy to help you guys out with that. Okay. Thank you so much and all uh, stay safe and uh, stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye.